done. You've made the only smart choice. Slytherin. I'll show you the right way to play Quidditch. The Harry Potter franchise has been used to create games not only for every entry in the main series, but also a whole range of spin-off games. From the good to the less good. <laughs> One part of the early main games that always felt a little bit underdeveloped was the Quidditch, where you only get to play as Harry to catch the snitch. But what if they made a fully fledged Quidditch game where you get to play as all the different players and have fun at the same time? Let's have a look at Harry Potter Quidditch World Cup. Harry Potter Quidditch World Cup was developed and published by EA in 2003, the year between when the Chamber of Secrets and Prisoner of Azkaban movies and games were released. I'm guessing someone at EA was thinking, hmm, we don't have anything to release for the Christmas period this year without any Harry Potter films coming out. And thus, Harry Potter has branched out into the sports genre of video games. Instead of the usual action-adventure style of the film-based games, Quidditch World Cup plays more like FIFA but for nerds, which makes sense seeing as EA also produces the FIFA game series. Starting up the game, we are greeted by a stunning pre-rendered video leading to the main menu where you are given four options. The first, Hogwarts, takes us to an introduction into Quidditch by Harry and Oliver Wood. For those of you who need brushing up on the rules of Quidditch, each team has seven players, three chasers that pass the quaffle around with the aim of throwing it into one of their opponent's rings to score ten points, a keeper who tries to prevent their opponent from scoring, two beaters that try to protect their own players from the dangerous bludgers and hit them towards their opponents, and a seeker who tries to find and catch the golden snitch, awarding their team 150 points and ending the game. You may then choose which of the four Hogwarts houses you want to compete as to win the Hogwarts Quidditch Cup. I chose Ravenclaw because I'm smart, where I learned that Cho Chang was apparently the Ravenclaw Seeker. Didn't know that apparently? The Hogwarts section of the game act as the tutorial, where before your first Quidditch match you are taught the basic moves. Passing the quaffle is easy enough by pressing pass and pointing in the direction of the chaser you wish to pass to. You can also hold the pass button down to throw the quaffle with more force. Next up is tackling and scoring, again simple enough, where you can steal the quaffle from an opponent's chaser by pressing the tackle button when you are next to them, and score by pressing the shoot button, where again holding it in shoots with more force. There are pros and cons to holding in the pass or shoot buttons, where a faster throw means the quaffle is in the air for less time, but there is a bigger chance of the opponent stealing the quaffle from you, or more time for the keeper to block the ring you are aiming at. Thirdly is catching the golden snitch, although in the challenge you are actually catching an escaped golden snidget, a magical bird that was used in Quidditch until they were becoming endangered, and the golden snitch was made as an alternative. Something that I didn't know about until I played this game. The snitch leaves behind a golden trail as it zooms through the air, and although the game flies the seeker in the general direction for you, you have to steer to keep yourself centralised in the trail, building up your boost bar. You can then boost towards the snitch, where eventually you can attempt to catch it. After completing these exercises, you can play your first Quidditch match. Mine was against Hufflepuff. Ooh, the Quidditch pitch looks lovely in winter. To start the match, the referee, in this case Madam Hooch, throws the quaffle into the air, and the first team to catch it when it glows green starts the match. The first match is pretty easy, but it is a good opportunity to try out passing, shooting, and tackling in a proper match. To imitate the time it takes the seekers to find the snitch, each team has a snitch bar at the top of the screen, where the more you pass the quaffle, the more your snitch half slides along. When both of the snitch halves meet, the seekers find the snitch, and the chase is on. The size of each team's boost bar is proportional to how long their section of the snitch bar is. In this first match, I ended up not catching the snitch, as helpfully the game doesn't tell you that you can also hold forwards on the movement controls to lean forwards, making yourself go even faster. I was wondering why it was taking so long for me to catch the snitch. However, I still won as I managed to rack up 260 points before the snitch made an appearance. Following the match, two more exercises are unlocked, introducing bludgers, dodging and special moves. Throughout a match, you are given opportunities to use these different abilities indicated on screen with these various symbols. When you don't currently possess the quaffle, the bludger can be hit towards your opponent, where you are given control of the bludger and should hit the chaser with the quaffle to gain possession and avoid their beaters. If the opponent is trying to hit you with a bludger, you can attempt to swing round to get your beaters to hit the bludger away, although I wasn't very good at this. Launches another bludger attack! Dodging can be used to swerve away from an opponent trying to steal the quaffle from you, although I found in easier matches I didn't really need to dodge that much. Special moves are used to either steal the quaffle from the opponent or to score a goal, but they cannot be disrupted by the opponent, 
and so they act as a sort of treat for players who play well, giving them a free goal or tackle. They can be fun to watch, although the animations can get a bit repetitive. Once or twice in the match, depending on your performance, you are also rewarded with a team special move, a long and visually impressive move where your team comes together to score up to three goals, depending on the team, and reduce your opponent's snitch bar. Some teams are better behaved than others. After beating Slytherin, the final exercise introduces combos, where holding the combo button, the more you pass to your teammates, the higher the combo can reach, up to a maximum of eight. The combo can then be banked by scoring, filling up your snitch bar. There is a balance between wanting to chain together a high combo, but not wanting your opponent to tackle you and take possession of the quaffle. Finally, I took on Gryffindor, and won the Quidditch Cup. The prize? Tickets to the Quidditch World Cup! Returning to the main menu, World Cup is now unlocked. You now get to choose a team to play as in the World Cup. From England, USA, Japan, Germany, France, Australia, the Nordic team, Spain, and Bulgaria. Although Bulgaria is only unlocked when you collect a certain number of wizard cards. That's right, wizard cards are back again! In this game, they are awarded for completing exercises under a certain time, and for a range of match-based tasks, such as beating a team in a certain stadium, or preventing the other team from scoring for the whole match. Different things can be unlocked after collecting a certain number of cards, or collecting particular cards, including access to stadiums, match difficulties, and team special moves. All of this is viewed in the inventory from the main menu, where it also contains the settings, list of special moves you've unlocked, and a rememberal to load or save your game. Back to the World Cup, each team has certain strengths and weaknesses in terms of passing, scoring, or their team's special move, although you are not made aware of these before playing. I chose Japan, knowing none of the info, but purely because they looked cool. But they actually ended up playing pretty well. The World Cup has 18 rounds, where each team plays each other twice, once in your home stadium and once in theirs. The stadiums themselves are great, and a visual highlight of the game. A quick look at them all. England's is predictably a medieval castle, complete with turrets and flags. USA's is on a New England farm at Halloween, with flying pumpkins and autumnal trees. Japan's is stunning, with fortress-inspired structures, cherry blossom, and a giant koi pond. Germany's is set in a mountainous forest with a German-looking castle. France's resembles the Palace of Versailles with a beautiful hedge garden. Australia's is inside a formation of red rocks, the Nordic Stadium being made completely of ice with aurora borealis in the sky. Spain's is built inside a castle with the evening sun beaming in, and Bulgaria's resembles a dark, gloomy gothic castle. In fact, the whole game itself looks and sounds pretty great. Most of the characters look good, where a slightly more cartoony style has been chosen, leading to a game that has aged well, unlike certain characters in Prisoner of Azkaban. Some of the non-Quidditch players can look a bit funny, but it's nice every now and then to be reminded that Ravenclaw won tickets to the World Cup. So cute. Throughout the matches, there are also a few mini cutscenes after special moves or after scoring goals, and they look pretty great, although it can get a bit repetitive. Although there are a few nice details, such as Bulgaria being overly aggressive with their tackling special move. The team special moves are also great, where highlights include Japan's with a lot of karate and fireworks, Australia's with waves and surfing action, and the Nordic team's ice-themed move. Bulgaria's is suitably violent, and England and the USA's are sports themes with football and basketball respectively. Some of the sound effects are also good, with nice details including the scoring sound being different in each stadium, such as the church bells in the Spanish stadium, the didgeridoo in Australia's, and a giant horn in the Nordic stadium. The music, again by Jeremy Soule, is about as magnificent as you could expect for a Quidditch game. The commentating is a nice touch, where Ludo Bagman is pretty good. With a long pass, Sato passes Suzuki unloads. No doubt about that one. Although some of the guest commentators can be annoying. If the player is not passing well, they should not be playing the World Cup with it. Although there are a few nice lines. Probably the best chasers in the world right now. Rubbish. Well, I'm sorry if you don't agree, but I'll oh, use it brainly then. Playing the World Cup, I had to play on second easiest difficulty, due to that's all I'd managed to unlock up to that point, which made most of the matches a breeze, and I won the World Cup in no time. 
Completing the World Cup unlocks a final stadium, Queerditch. Although it sounds like JK Rowling pandering to LGBT people despite having no LGBT inclusivity in the book series and also being a massive turf, Queerditch Marsh is actually the site on which the first match was played of a sport that would eventually morph into the Quidditch we know and love today. It would have been cool in the game if the match played in a slightly different way to reflect this, but as far as I can tell it is essentially just another stadium, but with lovely music. The main menu also has Exhibition, which is essentially how you can set up a custom match out of all the teams and stadiums you have unlocked so far. And it's here that I tried out the now unlocked Firebolt difficulty, the most difficult mode, and boy was it a lot harder. It kind of feels like actually playing against a real person. Speaking of, Exhibition mode also lets you play with another person locally, a nice feature. Although good luck finding anyone who would want to play this in 2020! I used to have this game on PS2 when I was younger, where local multiplayer makes perfect sense. Now that I've completed the Hogwarts Cup as Ravenclaw and the World Cup as Japan, there's the other Hogwarts teams and all the world countries to compete as to unlock all the remaining wizard cards. I could do that, but I've got better things to do. Bye! It is with great pleasure that I award this year's Quidditch World Cup to Japan! Yeah! So that's Harry Potter Quidditch World Cup. For an early Harry Potter game, it looks and plays pretty well. Obviously it could have been a bit more complex, and probably could have done a better job at explaining how to play, but for a spin-off game of a game series, of a film series, of a book series, it's actually pretty fun. I can't imagine they would make a Quidditch game like this again nowadays, but if they did, I would love to play some online Quidditch, assuming anyone else would be playing as well. But in the meantime, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Wow, look at those teeth. Teethy teeth teeth. Mr. Teeth. Teeth teeth teeth. This is brainly done! <clears throat>